In a way, this is a kind of early circuit board. Except it's made of slate and it weighs an absolute ton. Seriously, it is so heavy that uh, my knuckle that was healing nicely, when I picked this up, it, it split the skin the knuckle again. Yeah. Anyway, suffice to say, uh, I'm not going to do this as a competition, but uh, if you want to leave a guess down below to the nearest 10 grams, perhaps? Actually, make it to the nearest tenth of a kilogram. That's probably fairer. Um, and I'll let you know afterwards... Uh, once you've all had a wee guess at what this weighs. And uh, so, uh, let's say, as a rough example, 5.3 kilogram, okay? But it really weighs, it weighs quite a lot. It definitely doesn't weigh 5.3 kilograms. So I'm going to turn it over. And the, the construction on the back here, this is solid slate. It's thick slate. It's got solid core cables and uh, the uh, looped around these washers it's, and nuts and bolts and it's all just very heavy and these little uh, clamps that clamp together to bridge co contacts. I'm going to turn it over now. Oh. Yeah, it's heavy. It's very heavy. Ugh. For what it is. Which is an elevator controller. A very old-fashioned elevator controller. And the place this was in, I was working in the refurbishment of the place and they took this out and it was this lovely sort of ornate elevator and my, my van was next to the skip and they just chucked this controller into the skip and I thought, I really like that, I really do. And I lifted it out and also got one of the push button controllers, the, the little push button panels. I wish I'd taken more of the stuff once I realised how good the quality was because things like these contactors have carbon contacts. They've got the metal contact here, but what it's actually going on to is a carbon pad. And likewise, when you press the, the call button uh, at each floor, it was actually a, a carbon contact that you were actually pushing at the end of the button. So just indestructible, because these ones, they're not dealing with a huge amount of current. So the carbon just made a nice, good, clean, sort of self-wiping contact that was just really indestructible. So, uh, yeah, the company, that uh, the place that was, was getting rid of this, they didn't like it because it was an old-fashioned lift and it, it wasn't very subtle. It did that thing where you push the button and it just starts at full speed instantly, gets up to the floor that you're going to and stops absolutely dead with a loud bang, and then you have to pull the door open yourself. I mean, it's a harsh life. So this thing had been in for at least 30 years, uh, working reliably, hardly ever breaking down. And they replaced it with some electronic super duper one and it broke down almost every week and lasted three years until they had to replace it again. And then the replacement kept breaking down too and they kind of wished they'd just kept the old simple one instead. And there are a lot of these still in use, partly because some com companies are just too cheap to replace them and other ones because they realise that, you know, they're indestructible, there's no need to replace them because they're just so robust. So the operation is like this. When you press a button at the uh, at a particular landing, as far as I can see from rough trace out, uh, the appropriate uh, contactor goes in and it latches. And at that point, it actually kills power to the uh, call buttons for the other contactors so that they can't actually um, answer a call because that's what these uh, open. It's got two uh, normally open contacts that close here. And it's uh, one of them is used to latch the contactor. And the other two are normally closed that open up and that's probably feeding the signals through to the other ones. So it only takes one call at a time. It's not like, it's not designed for a lot of floors. It's literally just floor one, two and three. And they are actually labelled. This one uh, is FR1, FR2 and FR3. And uh, when you, uh, the, the position, it knows its position in the shaft. It's entirely electromechanical because uh, in the shaft itself, and I thought this was quite neat when I saw it. On the side of the car, it's that travelling up and down the shaft, there was a sort of metal rail that looked like this. And then a matching one that looked like that. And on a central line down the shaft were mounted these cam uh, roller switches, which uh, mounted onto big boxes with the carbon contacts in them again. And when you actually moved it to the side at three positions. If it, it could be either left, it would latch, it would sort of lock over to the left, or it would lock over to the right, or if it was held in the middle, it would be effectively 
uh, break contact with either of those connections. Uh, you know, it had a connection on either side. And the purpose of that was that as the, say for instance, the lift was above this one, the roller, it would have left the roller in that position as it passed it, it would have pushed it over to that side. As it was coming down again, it would push the roller to the middle, and if it was the the call was for that one, it would then break the circuit and it would stop dead on that level. If it was not that uh, floor, it would keep going down and it would kick the wheel over to the other side, and that way uh, the uh, the rollers actually indicated you could look at them and tell exactly where the thing was in the shaft because you know it just left them in the direction, a particular direction, as it passed them uh, in a different direction, up or down. Um, so, super simple that way. Uh, the contactors themselves that come in, well, the power to it for a start, it's a three phase lift, it doesn't have a neutral. It just, uh, as far as I can see, it's just the three phases come straight on, onto the contactor here. And it's got these uh, different terminals with a sort of screwdriver slot in them. And the three phases uh, are then going to the uh, they're being switched, but if one of these contactors comes in, it's going up, and if one of them comes in, it's going down. And if neither of them, they can't, both of them can't come in at the same time because there's a little seesaw mechanism underneath that uh, locks the other one out if uh, one comes in. And uh, the output of this goes down to the motor terminals here, just marked A, B, and C. And there's three large wires coming off the motor terminals. They're the three phase to the motor. And there's also two smaller wires for a 415 volt brake so that when the motor's energized, the brake comes off. Um, and as soon as the motor's de-energized, the brake comes back on to lock it, to stop it sort of freewheeling. Um, let me think. The two of the phases are taken over to these fuses, the, the CF control fuses. And they're used to actually power uh, things down the shaft. Now, I see three terminals marked one, two, and three. I'm guessing they might be the call pads. I've not actually traced this out. They might be the call signals, uh, the returns to the button, plus there'll be a common going out to them. There'll also be a safety circuit going down the shaft so that if any of the doors is open, it doesn't let any call actually be made. It basically just opens the circuit to the whole control circuit, which is, you know, it's how modern lifts work as well. And what, another nice thing about this is, um, let me think, is there anything I should be covering here? Yeah, I think I've got most everything. Yeah, the for servicing, unlike modern contactors where if the contacts go, you play, replace the whole contactor. With these ones, if you want to clean or replace a contact, you simply lift this little spring catch up, slide it back, oops, and when you do that, it just basically unlocks the whole assembly. And you can then either clean the contacts, or if one's really badly damaged, you can just press it down, turn it. Oop, it's a bit footry to do. And pop it out. Get a new one, place it down like this, press it in, rotate it, and that's it locked back in again. And then to put this back in, oh, incidentally, this is the bit that pushes down on the seesaw mechanism that uh, isolates from each other. Oh, it's also worth mentioning the uh, coils are literally just held in on the core by little metal flaps, three metal flaps folded, and the coil is, it almost looks like a toroidal transformer, but it's actually wound as a sort of big clump of cable, then wrapped in tape like a donut, and then stuffed over, and it's got a... It's got uh, lugs on it. I've, I've not taken one to bits because that would just be a complete sacrilege. And it's got little lugs in it, and I, these will be designed for operating, I'm guessing, at the 415 volt directly, these coils. So it's probably quite a lot of fine turns in them. Uh, so this, uh, once you've finished uh, changing the contacts, you can slot it back in. And it's interesting to note that if you took both of them out and you wanted to make sure you got them back in the right place, and I'm, I'm just making a complete dog's dinner of getting this back in, Oh, there it goes. And then lock it back in. If you actually look at the contacts, you can actually see the pattern on both the contacts and work out which one went where for making sure you get them back in the exact place because the, these rods are slightly different length and it may suggest that, you know, it's all been fine-tuned and you'd have to put the same contact bar in the correct place. So um, if you look at the contacts, you can actually see a pattern on them that matches the on both sides of the contact. So... Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's really neat. Uh, it also has this for spare fuses, but there are no spare fuses. I wonder if they've had a little technical incident. Uh, probably uh, involving, yeah, rubbed through wires or, or little technical incidents in the shaft while they're working it, which would be exciting because it is 415 volts going to all the contacts. But yes, it's a really neat, chunky thing. It's very retro and it is just indestructible. I mean, it wouldn't be too hard to diagnose a fault in it, like unlike modern elevators where, although they give you error codes, you can get some really weird faults where, say, you've got a processor keeps crashing or stuff like that. Here, you'd just come and give all the contacts a good clean, it'd probably be back up and running. You, you'd even see the damage if a contact had really worn. Just by watching it, you'd see the flash off it and so on. But uh, yeah, the, the, this is really neat. I, I like this a lot. Probably quite uh, visual as well, because this would just be mounted in the wall with a bolt at each corner, uh, spaced off the wall in studs. And when these came in, they would just, as I say, it would be open, you'd be able to just watch it in operation, it would just be the clack as these went in, and then these going in, and uh, then the um, you'd see the spark as it came out again. And I can remember as a kid seeing stuff like this operating, it was really actually fantastic to see stuff like this in operation. It was almost like slightly scary to a kid, but uh, now I find it, that sort of stuff quite uh, appealing. It's just got that sort of Frankenstein look. So yeah, when you place a call, uh, the contact comes in, takes that call, and would simultaneously bring in the um, the direction contactor for the motor. So the, the lift, if the all the doors were closed, would instantly start running until it reached its floor, and then everything would just cut out. And as long, you know, if if someone placed another call right at that very second before you'd had a chance to open the door, it would just go to that other call. But if you, as soon as you opened the door, it would just hold off until, uh, you know, everybody had finished loading and out the lift and then closed the door again and it completed the safety circuit and then another call could be made to another floor. Very neat. Uh, it's just a really nice, chunky thing.